Today's subject, it's a fairly big subject um, because there's lots of different varieties. But uh, I'm talking about um, magnolias and they're sort of, well they have been for the last probably 20 years flavour of the month in, in gardens as a ornamental tree. Um, there's lots of varieties that um, suit various spaces, even you know for smaller courtyard gardens or people that have got balconies, they haven't got room to accommodate a larger magnolia. Um, there are smaller varieties now which will uh, quite happily grow in a pot. Uh, the main requirement for all of them um, and that includes the evergreens and the deciduous magnolias, is sun. Um, if they don't receive enough sun, they, they, they don't tend to flower very well, and that sort of defeats the purpose of growing a magnolia tree. They love a, 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 a warm, open, sunny position. Now, it's not to say that they won't tolerate a little bit of shade. Uh, we've got um, a couple of the magnolia teddy bear planted in a garden bed at the bottom of the nursery here, which gets all the morning sun and then shaded from the hot afternoon sun um, by our large gum trees. And they still tend to flower quite well and they grow quite well, you know, without full day sun. But ideally, they're the sort of trees that you would plant in a full open sun position. Uh, another requirement of the tree is that they're in a good soil. It has to be well-drained soil. The soils in this area are all very clay-based, heavy clay-based soils. And if you were to take a magnolia and stick it straight into the clay without any sort of preparation done prior, then they won't tolerate it. Generally, they fail. So it needs to be a reasonable soil. Uh, by that, I mean well-drained. Um, with a, a reasonable amount of organic matter dug through at planting time. And that could be compost or it could be animal manures, whatever. Some of the uh, deciduous varieties particularly um, don't like, you know, those really sodden, heavy clay soils. This is um, uh, what they call the Yulin tree, or this is Magnolia denudata. It's one of the larger growing deciduous magnolias. Um, the deciduous magnolias tend to have the goblet type flowers um, that look like candelabras on the tree when there's no leaves on the tree uh, from July through to August and September in Melbourne. Uh, and they're very spectacular, particularly as they get older. Uh, very large flowers and um, quite a lot of flowers on the one plant. Uh, there's an old specimen in the garden here that's just profuse in flowers if the possums don't get to the flowers first. Uh, possums tend to love magnolias, particularly the new growth and particularly the flower buds. So these are all the flower buds here ready to start developing for spring flowers. They always occur on the ends of the branches. Um, some people might confuse those with leaf growth. They're actually um, they're actually flower buds. So the flower buds are always started to produce on the plants towards um, mid to late summer. Um, and then the leaves will turn yellow probably over the next six weeks or so. Um, they don't have spectacular autumn colour, but the, the yellow can be look quite attractive uh, when they do drop. Um, and then you've got the, the, the buds ready to open towards mid to late July, I guess, in Melbourne and then they continue flowering through to around about September, which is quite a long flowering period for a tree. Um, the beauty of them is too, flowering in winter, uh, when there's not a lot of other plants in the garden that have flowers, the magnolias can be um, quite an asset in the garden. They blend with things like camellias, obviously, which are flowering at that time as well. So in the deciduous types, there's a range of colours. Um, the Yulin tree is um, probably one of the most popular deciduous varieties, but there's um, a whole range of pink shades, uh, right through to really deep, dark, sort of purpley shades, um, which um, have similar shaped flowers. Uh, there's a couple of new ones um, uh, being released over the last few years, which have got even more intense colours. Vulcan. Um, as the name suggests, is a really deep sort of pinky red. Um, there's another one called um, Cleopatra. So um, you can even get them into almost a greeny yellow shade. Um, one called Elizabeth, which is the later flowering one. So if you wanted um, 
uh, a deciduous magnolia to flower, say, through September or October, then um, Elizabeth is, uh, is, a, is a good late flowering variety. Uh, the leaves are all very similar. Um, you can get um, some varieties which are a little bit shorter growing if you don't want or you haven't got the space for a large deciduous magnolia. There's one called the star magnolia or magnolia stellata, which has got like a, a smaller cluster of petals, more like a saucer shaped flower, which um, gets heaps of flowers on the one plant. Um, but they're good for a smaller space. And uh, the leaves on those particular ones tend to be a, a little bit smaller. But most of the deciduous magnolias have that large, typical sort of um, magnolia, magnolia leaf. Um, and surprisingly, they're quick growing plants. You know, a lot of people think, oh, I plant a magnolia, I'm going to wait years for it to grow. Uh, we've got one in the garden beds here at the front. I think we planted a variety called black tulip, which is a more of a, a flat cup shaped flower and it's intense, really deep burgundy colour in the, in the wintertime. It looks fantastic when it flowers. And that's already probably bigger than this, um, this tree here mm -hmm. after about um, four to five years. So they're pretty, they're pretty quick growing. In the um, evergreen range, they come in all different shapes and sizes. So a few examples here I've brought in. This is, um, this is a reasonably new one. This is called Little Sierra. Now that's not going to get much bigger than about two and a half metres high. So if you wanted an evergreen magnolia to grow in a pot and flower for a long period of time, these flowers continue on through until about September. Um, and uh, they're, they're very um, good in, in a pot situation where you haven't got a lot of space. Any of the evergreen ones can be pruned regardless of the type. And that includes even things like teddy bear, um, and uh, little gem, they're often used for hedging. A lot of people plant them and, um, and ride them together and then prune them to keep them at a certain height. So any of the evergreen ones are good for hedging. Um, this one particularly, if you're limited for space, is a, is a compact variety. Um, when it's not flowering, you've got quite a nice glossy leaf and they're hardy. Um, these really will tolerate, believe it or not, reasonably dry conditions in the summer even in a pot. Um, they don't like being overwatered, um, so if they're in a potting mix that's saturated, then they don't tend to perform very well. So uh, you can keep them a, a bit on the drier side. And again, they're quick growing and uh, make a very dense bush when they get older. Uh, so there's a range of these. That one's the Sierra. Uh, there's another one uh, which is uh, a little bit bigger, has a similar leaf similar flower uh, but a large growing plant up to around about three to four meters high so if you wanted to screen say along the back fence to block out the neighbors um, they will get there quickly and um, something a little bit different and, um, and very bushy flowers are unusual you know for a magnolia flower they're not big but you get lots of them and um, you might all be aware of the old port wine magnolia, which has that strong, um, I always thought they smelled a bit like bubble gum. Um, it's got that really strong um, scent. And these all originated from that plant. Um, they do a lot of breeding with different sorts of magnolias, and over time, they come up with the different flower types. So these are bigger flowers than actually the port wine magnolia. Port wine has a, a stronger perfume and a, probably a, a lighter green leaf. Um, these are new over probably the last 10 years. These are what they call fairy magnolias. Um, larger leaves again than these. Um, good sort of screening plants to about four metres high with um, very attractive sort of um, larger flowers in either pure white or you can get them in what they call blush. Yeah. Um, Lush has got, uh, it's more of a cream with a pink uh, tinge through the flower as well. They're both very strongly perfumed. So if you want a screening plant that, that grows well in hot, sunny conditions, um, a bit taller growing as a, a hedge or a screening plant with perfume, then um, either of those would be uh, very good. Do they um, bush, bush, um, get bushier as they grow? 
They say at the moment they look very open, yeah, because you know, they're only young plants, and as they get older, you need to prune them to encourage the bushiness. Okay. Um, they get pretty dense as they get older. If you don't prune them, they tend to be a bit more open in their habit. So, sort of plant that likes being pruned, just tends to keep it um, a lot denser. And particularly if you're going to hedge it, um, you know, even if you prune it up to say the height of a paling fence, um, the more you cut it, the thicker it's going to be. But uh, they'll get there pretty quickly. They're pretty, uh, uh, you know, fast growing shrubs. But nice flower, nice scent. Um, when they're all in, in full flower in spring, these don't flower until the springtime, but when they're in full flower, they're quite a noticeable scent. And the same with the, with the pink as well. Uh, speaking of scent, that large tree here um, is uh, what they call Magnolia or Alba. Now, the Alba has an unusual flower and then it's sort of curled, um, but beautifully perfumed. It's a really strong scent. It's very favourable with um, Asian cultures. Um, in uh, China, for instance, they grow these as large um, ornamental trees in parks or streets. Um, it is an evergreen, but uh, I think the flowers to Asian people are sacred and um, uh, probably partly because of the perfume. In the summertime, on a warm day, the perfume on these is sensational um, and they flower over a very long period of time. Uh, you probably all know, I've been around for a little while now, Magnolia Teddy Bear. Now, all the grand, this is a Magnolia Granaflora and there's a lot of the original Magnolia Grandiflora, which was the old, what they used to call Bull Bay, originates from southern USA. You know, that area where it's around Georgia and it's really humid and hot all the time. They love that sort of high humidity and warmth. Um, but they're a very adaptable plant. So over, over time, they've developed from the Bull Bay more compact varieties. The old Bull Bay used to grow into a massive old tree that might take 20 years to flower. Um, the uh, new varieties that they've developed now uh, flower a lot quicker, within probably 12 or 18 months of planting, and um, uh, they don't tend to grow as big. So teddy bear has probably been one of the most popular introductions. Um, we planted some in the car park gardens here about 10 years ago when they were first released, and unpruned, they've just grown beautifully into a very compact, cone-shaped um, tree. Uh, so they lend themselves to smaller gardens, grows up to about four metres high, lends themselves to smaller gardens or again to grow in a pot. Um, as long as they get a reasonable amount of water through the summer they're happy and as long as it's a hot sunny position. Um, they have huge... I went looking for a flower out in the car park, there's not a lot of them in flower at the moment. This is another variety called St Mary but they all have similar flowers big saucer shaped flowers, quite big, some of them up to about 25 centimetre diameter. And again, um, a nice perfume. So teddy bear has that really dark leaf with the dark underside. Some people don't like the underside being dark on magnolias. I think it's a nice characteristic in the plant. There was one that was developed that um, they call it greenback, magnolia greenback. Um, and it just didn't have the same look as, or you know, the same appeal as these, and they stopped growing it. Uh, it just wasn't very popular. But it's, the teddy bear is, um, you know, got that really nice dark green glossy leaf, and as long as it gets the water and it gets the food, it continues on. Now, with the, any of the evergreen varieties, including the Alba, uh, there's a certain time of the year when they shed their leaves. So the tree starts to grow as the weather warms up in October and um, as they produce their new leaves at the top of the tree they shed some of their older leaves and they can drop quite a lot of foliage, particularly if they're older, older and bigger trees. The leaves tend to yellow inside and brown off and then they all just drop off. The tree sort of renews its, its new growth and then it sheds some of its older leaves. So that's, that's normal for the magnolias to do that. A lot of people think the tree's suffering for one reason or another because it's 
was dropping all these leaves, but you could almost time it to the day when they'll start dropping. And the leaves are quite a big leaf, so um, they're fairly noticeable when they drop off, which some people don't like. But for an evergreen tree to look that good all year round, I think you can put up with a few leaves with browning off and yellow. Did you say you didn't need to prune them to shape? You don't need to prune these, no. Uh, occasionally you might get a, a rogue branch that looks out of character from the rest of the shape of the tree. So you can prune that back. Um, and probably the best time to prune them is through the warmer months because that's when they'll regenerate. Uh, if you do it in the middle of winter, they tend to look a bit, you know, harsh. But you don't have to prune them. They don't have to be pruned. Um, this tends to maintain its shape pretty well. This is another grandiflora type that's just been released. Um, it's called Sweet and Neat. So uh, it's probably, um, it's a little bit different from the, um, the teddy bears. The leaves were a slightly different shape. They're more pointed. Um, the tree doesn't grow as big. This average is up to about three metres high, um, which is pretty small for a grandiflora type magnolia, considering that the old parents used to grow about 10 metres high. Um, most of the breeding of these is done in America and then they, they come into Australia, you know, once they've been uh, quarantined and, and then uh, they grow them on over here. Um, this one's got very large white flowers, perfumed again, and um, uh, has that sort of shiny leaf with the darker underside, but the leaves are a bit, um, a bit narrow and the tree's a bit more compact. So if you wanted one for a pot that didn't grow too big or you had a small space in the garden, not a lot of room, then you could use um, use that variety. This has only just been released. Uh, I haven't seen them as a mature tree yet, but um, they sort of look like they might be promising. White caviar is another variety. Uh, this is... Uh, this gets a little bit of airplay on a lot of the gardening programs. Um, because it's got a... Uh, a larger leaf and a, a, probably, if anything, it's slightly glossier leaf. Uh, the flowers are similar to these types, but a bit bigger. And the plant itself grows to about four, maybe five metres, but again, can be hedged and kept at, um, you know, even two metres high if you wanted it to. Uh, a very dense hedge, very bushy plant, very hardy plant. Uh, and gets loads of flowers on it in the springtime. Most of these varieties, tend to flower in spring. The grandiflora types tend to flower through the hotter weather. They used to, you know, having those warm temperatures to encourage the flower. So you don't get a lot of flowers from now on through the winter, but one or two maybe. Uh, these are much um, better in the springtime, just getting massive flowers on the plant. And again, uh, perfume. I was just going to mention a little bit about um, feeding. I've mentioned about the soil types. Um, well-drained soil for any of them is really important. Not avoid the clay soils. An elevated garden bed is ideal, you know, to help with drainage and a reasonably good soil um, uh, they need to be planted into. Uh, as far as feeding goes, any general garden fertiliser is fine. Um, we tend to like uh, Osmocote because it's easy. Um, it lasts for quite a long time. You know, you get about three or four months out of Osmocote, um, whereas some of the other fertilizers you need to be putting on, like a, a liquid fertilizer, you might have to do it every two weeks or so. Uh, so this is convenient. Um, uh, it's just sort of a set and forget. You put it on, then you don't have to do it again until the springtime. That's suitable for any plants in the garden, uh, including, including pots. Uh, so that's a good all-purpose. You can get um, the more organic types if you wanted uh, uh, not to use chemical type fertilisers. This is, um, as the name suggests, suitable for any plants in the garden. Uh, it's more like the blood and bone type, uh, type consistency. Um, it's a powder, you just sprinkle it on water in. Uh, the osmocote doesn't start working until the water comes in contact with the fertiliser. It's like a little round bead and the water takes the fertiliser out of the bead itself and feeds the plant over an extended period of time. Uh, what they sometimes call controlled release fertilisers or slow release fertilisers. Um, but as I say, they're an easy one. 
these generally last about six to eight weeks. So through the warmer months of the year, uh, particularly large established plants, you'll be using that every couple of months uh, just to keep the plant fed. They love fertiliser. All the magnolias love fertiliser. Um, you often see old ones in the garden that haven't had enough food or enough water and they go yellow. They get a yellow tinge all over the plant. Instead of being that lovely dark green, mm -hmm. the whole plant looks yellow. So don't be afraid to feed them. Um, don't be afraid to do it regularly. In the winter time, um, we use a product called Dolomite Lime. Um, and it's very underutilised in gardens. Um, uh, it's used a lot on, for instance, box hedging to keep the nice dark green colour in the leaf of the box head. And uh, it needs to be applied once a year in, um, in winter. Uh, but it can also be used on all the plants I mentioned, on magnolias. The beauty of dolomite lime as opposed to normal garden lime, this has got calcium in it and magnesium in it. Calcium is what keeps the green in the leaf. So don't be afraid to use that. Probably once a year, I put it on around about July, August. And, uh, and then through the warmer months, use you know, whatever fertiliser you're used to using. Some people like liquid fertilisers. Um, the liquids you have to use more often because they're washed out of the soil quicker. So uh, you might have to use a liquid fertiliser every two to three weeks, whereas with these dry fertilisers, you know, that one's two months. That one's every three to four months, so I think they're convenient, you know, easy to use. You don't have to dig them in, you just sprinkle them on the top, water them, and then they'll start working. Is the root system in basement? On the... On the new leaves? No, no. Um, not at all. They're not um, an aggressive root system, even though it's a reasonably sized tree. Um, we've got teddy bears, in fact, we've got St Mary, which is that one with the flower. Um, planted in the car park garden. Those big round ball magnolias in the car park garden, this one, that's Magnolia St Mary. Um, that's a large tree, probably five to six metre high tree. Um, they've been in the gardens now for 20 odd years. We prune them once a year. They're due for a prune actually in the next couple of weeks. We prune them to shape because if we didn't prune them, they'd just grow out like a normal tree. And we don't want them to grow too big. Um, uh, and they're in a fairly confined garden bit out there and they've got other plants growing around them and there's no issues. Are these particular ones here? Yeah. And she's growing them in the head. Yeah. But they're going from yellow. All over? Or just well, the lower? Well, either end are looking fine. Yeah. Just, it's the sort of plant that um, doesn't mind a little bit of fertiliser, you know, every now and then. Yeah. If, if they're over watered, Magnolias tend to yellow more. Uh, so uh, you'll get, particularly low down, you'll get some of this sort of foliage. I haven't got one here that's doing it, but they tend to lose some of that older foliage. It tends to yellow off. If it's doing it a lot, you're losing a lot of foliage, sometimes because the plant's too wet. And they'll tolerate, as I said, reasonably dry conditions. Um, so maybe just these back when you're watering a little bit. Well, it's certainly along. Oh, You've got to okay. acknowledge you bought a couple of years ago yeah. and it hasn't grown at all, but I've got a photo of it. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's the one there she's got. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's where it is. Yeah. It's on the east side of the house. Right. That's all right. And looks like it's in an open space. Yeah, it's in an open, yeah. So it looks like she's got mulch around it. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And the soil's all right. Yeah, bark. The soil's all right. The soil I've got a load from the nursery of. Um, the compost one, and uh, the mixture of it. And the drains yeah, well. But I noticed here, some of the other ones here have gone a bit yellow, so maybe... Yeah, might need a feed. A feed? Yeah, it looks like it's lacking. When you've got mulch of any type on the garden, particularly bark mulches, yep. as they start decomposing, they take all the nitrogen out of the ground. Um, it's fairly thick too. Yeah, so that can be a problem. Sometimes what can happen uh, with thick mulch, um, it, makes like a, a barrier so okay. the water can't get through yeah, yeah. and the air can't get through and then as it breaks down um, it takes nitrogen out of the soil to okay. help in, the, in right. the decomposition and that takes away from the tree mm -hmm. so um, probably 40 50 millimeters of mulch is, is plenty, is plenty. Uh, I'd probably take some away feed it around the plant 
it's, it's getting late for feeding the deciduous ones now because they're going to lose their leaves shortly. Yeah. Uh, but certainly in the springtime, I'd give it a good feed as it's coming back into leaf.